the challenge that goes deep <coughs> to heal, to set us on the right path. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, Jesus is coming on really strong now. He says, anyone, uh, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Wow, I mean, this is really something. It's really strong. But Jesus has carefully led us up to this point, as we've been seeing over the last few weeks. He starts out with grace. Anyone can come. You're blessed if you just come to Jesus wherever you come from. You're blessed coming to him. You receive life. As he is to say later on, I put the quote in the little um, insert in the um, little white insert in the program there. Um, as he's to say later on in Mark 10:45 and it's in Matthew 20, uh, 24 as well. Now, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's done what it takes. Jesus came to live out of love for you, to die out of love for you, and to rise from the dead, so that because of that, you are accepted. You come to Christ, you say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. It's a free gift. We're blessed, we're received. So then he goes on from this beginning with grace, moving on to, there's another blessing now, a second blessing, that you can be world changers. You are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. By coming next to Jesus, you're transformed. There's this life-changing power within you so that your world changes just by being next to Jesus. Then he comes on to, to say the details of how this is to be lived out. And that's what we're getting into now. And first he lays down the general principle of the authority of Scripture. And Jesus points to himself as no other religious leader, at least not one who's sane, does. Um, yeah, I mean, there have been people um, who have been committed to lunatic asylums who have claimed to be Christ and Saviour of the world. But here was a man who is eminently sane and who claims to be speaking the very words of God. And so the words that we have, the words of Jesus, the accounts of his life, and the words of the people he commissioned to go out and tell Peter and Paul and James and John, these ones uh, had the authority of God. Jesus gave them this authority, commissioned them to go out, and so what we have in the New Testament, Jesus gives it the authority for our lives, the guide that we're to live by. Challenging, but it works. It's the way of life. So through grace, we've come to this point now of guidance. In general, scriptures are to be your guide, the New Testament, and then the whole thing. And then going on from there, he starts going into details six particular issues here, and this is dealing with the issue of disagreements and anger and resentment between people. He shows the way to live, he shows the way of life, a way of life of reconciliation and living at peace with other people, and we say, is it possible? But yes, with Jesus it is possible because he gives the resources which are himself, his spirit living in us to make it possible to live the good life. People were asking this question, and the Jews, the Bible scholars, the Bible teachers, and the religious people were, worked very, very hard to figure out how can we live the good life? Okay, well, Moses, God gave us the law through Moses. And then they did what they called, they built a fence around the law. They made, as the, were the Lord, very broad. An example of this, which is a really good example, in uh, Exodus, it's in Exodus um, 34, verse 26, there's this little verse which says, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Like, what? Um, I think what it must have been, there must have been terrible pagan religions, and one of their customs would be to boil a kid in its mother's milk. I mean, we used to raise goats, and um, the goat would have a kid, and I'd milk the goat and make cheese and stuff, and then yogurt, and then we'd um, kill the baby and eat it. Um, that's um, what you listen to. That's life on a farm. And, and, but there's this strict prohibition in the law. Well, because of that, the Jewish Bible teacher said, okay, we've got to be very careful never to get meat and milk mixed up. And so in any Orthodox Jewish home, there are four sets of plates. One set of plates for meat and one for milk for most of the year, and another for meat and milk at Passover. 
dairy products, meat products, so that if somebody didn't quite do the dishes correctly and there was a little bit of butter left on this plate, you wouldn't have a steak on it the next day by mistake. A fence around the law by enlarging it to have all these details to live up to. They thought we could live a good life. Jesus took a completely different approach. He deepened the law to make it go deep into our hearts and our emotions and our thoughts, our desires. He sent it deep because God wants our hearts. As he said in that wonderful verse in Micah, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to live justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Very easy to say. It takes a lifetime to learn to do it. It goes deep. It's as if there's a family and a husband who's a workaholic and he spends hours working, going along business trips, he's never home, to make lots of money to provide every little thing, every little Xbox game and big screen TV and fancy car, everything that his family would want. What they want is him at the dinner table with them, to play with the kids, to laugh with them, to cry with them when they're hurting. But he's so busy working to provide their needs. And that's kind of the way people taking this legalistic approach, doing busy stuff to try to please God, to identify we really belong to God. And Jesus says, God wants your hearts. He wants your love. He wants your devotion. That's what he wants. So he sets these new standards. Anyone, uh, yeah, it was said, don't murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment, he said. But he sets this new standard. Anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. The anger Jesus is talking about here is a long-term <coughs> bitterness of resentment against some other person or some group of people like that. There's also the anger that flares up in a moment that can get you into trouble. And that's a problem too. That's what the Proverbs is talking about. There's a great line by Francis Bacon. Anger makes dull men witty, but it also makes them poor. The guy who's not a very good worker and he's really mad at his boss, he says something that's really clever and it's a brilliant little remark and he gets fired because he made it. You know, anger makes men witty, but it makes them poor. The anger that flares up that you want to keep under control. Jesus here is talking more about the long-term resentment that one can hold in and feed the fuel of thoughts to it so that it stays alike, alive over the years, over the weeks anyway, over the years. That kind of anger is um, subject to judgment. And then he says, anyone who calls his brother, what it means is a brainless fool. If you call somebody, you low IQ idiot, something like that, you know. Um, then, he, first he says subject to judgment. The judgment will be the local court, the local village or town court. Then the next, if you call somebody a brainless idiot, then you're subject to the supreme court of that whole country. And then he says, anybody who says of somebody else they're evil, who destroys their reputation, it's easy over the teacups or coffee cups to say something. I was thinking of that line in, in the old movie Steel Magnolias where Shirley MacLaine plays this character and she says, if you can't think of anything good to say about somebody, Come and sit next to me and talk to me. You get it, right? That kind of line, destroying somebody's reputation. And Jesus said, that person, if that's what you're doing, you're worthy of a rubbish pit, of the fire. The judgment is not some arbitrary judgment that's clamped down after a while. It's what happens within. If you are holding a little fire of bitterness in some place within you, if you're putting other people down and destroying reputations, that fire is eating away and corroding your own soul and your own life, and the judgment starts now as that is happening, as you're holding on to and nursing that anger, whether it's against the government or the North Koreans or your neighbor on the street or your neighbor in the pew next to you in church, nursing that corrodes and burns away from inside, and so Jesus for our own good, warns us about that kind of long-standing anger, about 
calling people names like that. The word he uses, it's translated the fire of hell here, is actually the word Gehenna, which is used straight in a lot of translations. It was a valley that was to the southwest of the old city of Jerusalem. Now it's all filled in with rubble, so the old city is leveled up there, but it used to be the valley of Hinnom. Gay means a valley, Gehenna, Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom. And what the, the situation with this place was that when the kings were in Israel, some of them were really wicked kings, and King Ahaz had this practice of worshipping the god of power, Baal, and the god of power he worshipped by burning children alive. It was a horrible religion, but he was sucked into this for the desperate desire for power. Well, then Josiah came along. Josiah was a good king. He did away with all that kind of worship. He cleaned up the place, and so he made this place where there'd been this horrible human sacrifice into a rubbish pit. And so people would throw their junk there, and it would be burning. It was kind of a town incinerator. There'd be a pile of smoke hanging over it. Um, that's what he's talking about. If you're destroying people's reputations from the bitterness and resentment that comes within you that you're stoking, you're burning yourself up like that rubbish pit. So what to do about it? Jesus gives two commands. Very straightforward. First, he says, reconciliation takes precedence over worship. Verse 23, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. It's kind of, uh, Jesus has a way of exaggerating. The people he's talking to are in Galilee. It's three days journey to Jerusalem. So the person in this little story has made the trip to Jerusalem. They've come to the temple. They've gone into the outer court. They've bought an animal for a sacrifice. They've gone through the court of women, through the court of Israel, to the priests. And there they give the sacrifice to the priests who is going to slaughter it, clean it up, and then they'll get some of the meat, and the priests will get some of the meat, and some will be burnt. However, that sacrifice is going to work. Okay. So as the person is coming through the courts, he remembers, wow, that guy back home, I really messed him up. I'd better get that sorted out. So in Jesus' picture, he leaves the animal there, takes a three days journey home, sorts out the problem, and comes back a week later. Well, it's an exaggeration. But the point is, we need to be right with each other before we can be right with God. We need to be reconciled. God loves people. He loves this beautiful planet he made, and he loves the people he put there, all of them. And Jesus came to die for anybody and everybody, for a Taliban. A Taliban fighter, Jesus came to die for that person. And I've heard that there are Taliban coming to faith in Christ to be reconciled. Jesus went to that extreme of love on the cross for the sake of your brother or sister against whom you may have some resentment. And God loves that person. And how can you be reconciled to God when you've still got it in your heart against that other person. That's what Jesus is saying. Make peace. Get things sorted out. It even takes precedence over worship, which is <clears throat> really significant, but goes back to much of what the prophets are saying. The prophet Isaiah, what means this trampling of my courts? Why do you bring all these sacrifices? What I want is your hearts. What I want is peace in the community. That's what I want to see. Make peace. Some people from this church went to a conference at uh, Bridges, I think it was, on peacemaking with a guy called Sandy. And one of the principles, it was very, very good stuff. One of the principles I heard there, supposing you've got a disagreement with somebody else, okay, and they've really messed you up, and there's this problem between you two, and the problem is 98% the other person's fault, and only 2% of the problem is your fault. You can imagine a situation like that. Has anybody ever messed you up like that? Where you did a little thing and they just really blew it out of proportion and really messed you up coming from that. What this guy says, and it's really true, is you are 100% responsible for that 2%. You're not responsible for the 98% that the other person did wrong, but for your 2%, you're 100% responsible and you need to make peace on the basis of that. It's really challenging, but it can happen. Make peace, he says. It's very good advice. Settle out of court is basically what he's saying here in 25. And it's such a litigious um, atmosphere in which we live. I was just reading, we have this little Dave Barry calendar. And he had this really neat thing. He says, my son, 
This is a typical, great little quote from Father D. He says, my son is learning to drive. He's four years old. Well, technically he's 15, but I still think of him as four. And so far, the only driving experience he's had is with little, driving around little Fisher-Price plastic men. And they're probably not gonna sue us, but in America, who knows? And now he's going out on the road with real people, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in this litigious society, Jesus is saying, settle out of court, get it dealt with, make peace. A very interesting example happened just this last week. On Tuesday, June 12th, the Presbytery of San Francisco met, and we had our new Presbytery pastor, who seems like a really good guy, who's really gonna help us. He's for 72 churches, so he's gonna be busy. And I had a nice little chat with him, and hope to see more of him as he helps our church, being a pastor of the pastors. But the big issue was the dismissal policy. If a church wants to leave the Presbytery of San Francisco, and to leave the Presbyterian Church USA, and keep their property, what process do they have to go through? And about two years ago there was a meeting, I wasn't there. The thing is that in this um, issue, there are two diametrically strongly opposed sides. There's one group of churches that say, from our point of view, the Presbytery is a drag on the industry, the PCUSA has got a bad name. We want to maximize the effectiveness of our mission and our ministry, and we feel that being connected with this is a hindrance, so we want to leave and take our property with us and do it as easily as possible. And there's another group that say, no church should ever leave the presbytery. We promise to stay together. We belong to each other. We're one family. Okay, there's disagreements. That's typically in a family. We need each other. Let's get on together. And so we had this meeting a couple of years ago, which just went toxic and spun out of control with amendments to amendments, and people getting angry, and it was very, very difficult. You can see that and there's millions and millions of dollars worth of property involved in this when a church wants to leave with their property. It's a big, heavy issue with diametrically opposed sides. And so what very wisely the Presbytery did was call in a mediator whose name was Tim Talmud. And he is uh, quite a high flyer. The first <coughs> meeting, he's from Pepperdine. Pepperdine has a school of mediation, which is really very helpful. And the first meeting, the group which contained of 12 people from both sides, diametrically opposed, who came into this with bitter resentment and complete lack of understanding of the other side as they came in to sit down together around this table. The first meeting was a conference call with Tim Townall in Cairo, Egypt, where he was negotiating peace in the Middle East. And so he's got some experience. He was good. And he brought them into a place in Christ with scriptures, and I've written some of these scriptures on the back of the little insert here. Colossians 3.12 Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love must be sincere, from Romans 12. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, as Paul writes in the first letter, in his letter of Philippians. Consider other people's interests more important than your own, hugely challenging. And then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Matthew 7. And scriptures like that brought these people to a sacred place where they could hear one another and understand the pain, the commitment, the position that they each had. And they came up with a policy, a dismissal policy, which we voted on on Tuesday, and it's very, very good. It lays out the process extremely clearly. It makes a deal which neither side wanted, but both sides coming together in Christian love realized that this was the best that they could get. You know, that this side, this side wanted to make a church probably pay the whole price of the property to the presbytery. This side wanted to leave scot free. We made an agreement. We voted almost over one week, almost unanimously in favor of this. 
a huge disagreement, a real disagreement here, with bitterness on both sides, but in the light of Christ, in these New Testament scriptures, from Paul mainly, as I was saying, the words of Jesus, the words of Paul, Jesus authorizing Paul to bring these words as the authority in our lives to bring peace to us. And so it is possible, even in situations like that, Anger comes up. There's, I mean, anger, anger is part of the human equipment. If somebody doesn't have any anger, they're deficient. Jesus was a fully equipped human being with a full physical and emotional range that anybody has. And Jesus was angry. If there was somebody there who was sick and the religious people were trying to stop that person getting healed, Jesus was angry at the wrong being done to this sick person. He could get angry. Uh, angry can be, anger can be productive. If you're angry about the pesticides that are being used on food and the pollution in the air and the number of cases of Parkinson's disease and cancer that this is calling, causing, then you can write to a representative to say we want the laws changed so that we don't have so much poison in our food because it's messy. You know, if, if you're angry about that, if you're angry about something, you can do something about it. If you're not going to do anything, you just have to forget it. I've known people who just watch the TV news and fume and rage and get angry and don't, do it, don't even write a letter or make a phone call. What's the point, you know? You've got to let some things go, decide. Anger can be really productive, but it can also get you in big trouble, as Francis Bacon said. Um, yeah, anger makes dull men witty, but it makes them poor. Horace, the great Roman, said, anger is a temporary insanity. And that's true, we can get angry, and whether it's the flaring up or the long term, it distorts. And yet, Jesus has given us his spirit so that we can step back and look and see what's happening to me now. There's a thing I've noticed sometimes when people um, are skipping a meal or two and their blood sugar gets low. I was with a situation one time and there was this person in the party we were walking around actually in, in, it was in Pasadena on um, Colorado, Colorado Avenue and there were um, Colorado Boulevard and there were lots and lots and lots of restaurants and this person's blood sugar I could see was going down and down and she was getting more and more snippy. Well that restaurant's no good, well no we can't eat that because that restaurant's no good and the further we walked along missing restaurants the worse she got. You need to be able to, we have in the Holy Spirit to think okay this is what's happening, I'm feeling this way, I need to get a bite to eat. And the same with anger. The Holy Spirit has given us the ability to say, what's going on here? Why am I feeling this? What is this? Maybe, it might be physical symptoms, a knot in the stomach, a slight headache or something. It might be just thoughts about somebody. And you can step up a level and look down at yourself with the eyes of Christ and say, what's going on here? What is this? Okay, how can I deal with it? Love must be sincere, hate what's evil, cling to what's good, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, cling to scriptures like that. There's healing there from this. Step back and remember, Jesus is in you, in his Holy Spirit. He is the one who, for your sake, when they were torturing him to death, said, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He did that for us, and because of that, we have in His Spirit the freedom to look down and say, I can get out of this. There's a process, Matthew, uh, Jesus lays it out in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go to him, tell him his fault, deal with it. Don't go around the back and talk about them, but say, look, what happened here? Can we work this out? If he can't, then go with somebody else and talk it through. There's a process there in Matthew 18, starting verse 25, which is a good process. But above all, remember, this is what Jesus did for you and for whoever, no matter what they've done to our nation, to you, whatever they've done, Jesus loves them. And there's the possibility of hope and reconciliation being at peace with our neighbor. He's done what it takes. He's paid the price. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your amazing love. I constantly come back, Lord, to that promise which you gave us in John 16, 33. In the world you will have trouble, but rejoice, I have conquered the world. 
Thank you, Jesus. You're so realistic about human nature. And you have such great wisdom, and more than wisdom, you have power within us to know you, to experience the healing power of your spirit within. Help us, Lord. We thank you, God, for your amazing grace, your goodness, and your love. God, use us to bring peace. Blessed Jesus, you said, blessed are the peacemakers. We blessed him, Tamil, for his role here with other churches in the Middle East, bringing reconciliation as a mediator. And use us, Lord, to bring peace, to bring peace between people and you as people come to put their trust in you and realize that, Jesus, you died for them as you did for us. And you rose from the dead to conquer death for them and for us. And so in you, we are one, Lord. Even when we don't feel it, we thank you for your love and your goodness and your almighty power. God, this time of heading up for the election in November. And we're grieved sometimes at the insults and misrepresentations that politicians sling at each other. And Lord, we ask you to bring a sense of the good of this nation and of the world rather than party politics as we move into the election. Give us wisdom to vote, to organize, to write, so that the best may come, so that we may live in peace and peace may spread in the world so that your gospel, your good news, Jesus, your good news, Jesus, may go out into the world. We thank you, Lord. And we gather our prayers together in the words which you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, and all of you, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, and on earth and in this kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 